Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the philosopher, um, he was beaten by his governess and didn't much enjoy it and found it very painful, but that became a positive incentive to be desired. And all he writes, if you have a look at his book, Confessions, every sexual encounter afterwards was merely a weak imitation of his original and he was fantasizing about the beating. So this is the kind of process that we are talking about. Anger at a woman then translates itself into a sexual target. And anger at the mother is a common one. Henry Lee Lucas is one of the most dreadful of all America's long series. And they're mostly Americans, so take comfort. See how you go. <laughs> <laughs> so they're mainly American. Not exclusively, of course, because we have a peer like Fred West. But um, you know, all my examples, not all of them, probably nine out of ten, if not more, are American. Um, he was severely beaten. He grew up in a log cabin in Virginia. His mother was a prostitute. They all lived in the same room. He was made to watch her in action. Uh, he was beaten with a stick, and you'll see that he, 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 he actually lost his left eye, um, which, which is very, very sad. Um, some people ask, why do they go and take alternative figures, quite innocent women, why don't they just kill the mother? Well, some of them do, and he did. He took a number of innocent victims and killed his own mother. This, uh, another example, is uh, the uh, so-called co-ed killer. He also murdered his mother and his grandparents, as well as uh, serious innocent women. <coughs> the Hillside Stranglers, uh, they also objected to their mothers. Their mothers, they claim, were both, were both mothers were prostitutes. And but when the profile came from the, the FBI, what were they, what were they looking for? Um, the local police were told, you're looking for a man who couldn't get on with his mother. And the cops in, in Los Angeles said, well, that's a great help in a place the size of Los Angeles, isn't it? Well, the, the shrinks were half right, because they were looking for two men who couldn't get on with their mothers. And um, the case of Kenneth the Yankee, the, the one at the top there, um, the one thing about them is they love to be associated with the police and the investigation. If they can somehow get involved in the investigation to get feedback on how it's going, to get this frisson on being with the police, he applied to join the police but was turned down. Uh, but subsequently, he went, at the time, he said, could they please give him a tour of the killings of sites around Los Angeles? And they declined. But it's a good example of how this gives a kind of frisson to these folk. Um, the Vienna Woods killer is an interesting case, uh, an unusual case. Vienna, in Austria, was pretty relatively crime-free, uh, and it still is relative to some places. Um, they had an investigator uh, known as Jack Unterweger. He was, a, he was a celebrity intellectual in Viennese society, and he volunteered to see if he could help the police to crack the case. And he got a grant to research the killings. He also got a grant to go to Los Angeles, where there had been a series of similar killings. And so there he did, and he came back and gave a press conference um, on his research. Well, not many people realized, and you might have tweaked already, that he's wearing two hats at the time, because not only is he investigator, he's also the serial killer. And again, it was a case of he was abandoned at birth by his mother, was brought up by his grandfather, who was deeply resentful and had this kind of hatred for women. But what, what Jack Winterweger shows is that it's not a deprivation effect. I mean, he was the toast of the town in Vienna. Adoring women were throwing themselves at him. Evening court, there was a whole load of groupies sitting there in tears. Um, so it wasn't deprivation of the conventional sexual outlet that led him to this. Rather, it was a bit over and above conventional sexuality. It was something extra. Anger at the partner, uh, form a sexual desire, a uh, sexual target for desire plus aggression. Uh, there is an awful case in London of Levi Belfield, who was found guilty of killing Billy Dowler, who brought the downfall of the news of the world. Uh, it seems, you don't know exactly what went on there, 
but he experienced intense anger at blonde women. And it was tracked that he'd been jilted when he was a young man by a blonde woman. And it's suspected, her body was found later, it was suspected that he actually killed her. And then he roamed around London attacking women in the street with a hammer, blonde women, selected them. Now, the interesting thing is his desire was also towards blonde women. So he desired them and hated them at the same time. It's a very good example of the efficacy of CCTV. The police uh, looked at over a quarter of a million images of white vans before they managed to identify his white van and bring them to justice. You get um, sexual target for desire and aggression, anger at mother and a partner. And that is the case of Ted Bundy there. Well, as you can appreciate, quite a handsome looking man. Again, he wasn't sure of consensual sexual contact. But it is suggested that he was angry at his mother because he was not sure who his mother was. And he was told that his real mother was his sister and his grandmother was his mother. When he found out he was angry, he was also angry at being jilted. That seems to create inordinate pressure for saying some men at being jilted. Uh, why some are so angry at being jilted and never get over the experience, I really don't know. Um, some are uh, angry at mother, wife, and sex workers. And here is a case. This is um, Gary Leon Ridgway, the so-called Green River Killer from Seattle. And he had early, some quite traumatic early experiences with the presence of his mother. He was a bedwetter, as many of them are. And the mother would spend quite a long time, apparently, cleaning him up. Um, so he got a mixture of sexual arousal and embarrassment of that. He picked easy targets, sex workers. They're absolute sitting time targets for, it's like picking up stool pigeons with a gun, because they, they, they're desperate for the money, uh, to the next drug fix in most cases. They're desperate for the money, and they'll get into anybody's car without asking too many questions. Even at times when all this is going on, as it was in Ipswich, they still would willingly get into strangers' cars uh, because to get the, the heroin fix, or in some cases the cocaine fix. Um, he saw himself as doing mission killing. He said, they're undesirables, I want to get rid of them. Apparently one, if not more, had given him venereal disease, so he saw his mission in life to get rid of them. But, of course, he could have just shot them. He didn't actually have to have sex with them and strangle them at the same time. So, again, it's a merging of sexual desire and anger. Anger at father, homosexuality, sexual becomes a sexual target for desire plus aggression. Um, there's in a case, he was bullied terribly by his father, John Wayne Gacy. Anyone recognize her? Cut. Yes. It's the wife of President Carter, Rosalind Carter. I mean, he was a local celebrity in Chicago, a builder, a charity <coughs> fundraiser, etc. Um, so and he would kill gay men uh, while, they, while they were performing sex on him. He would kill them and put them under his crawl space, under his house, with 33 there before he got arrested. Um, it shows the psychopathic mind, because the police said, we're, bringing, we're charging you with 33 murders. And his comment was, yes, and I'm bringing a complaint against you, the mess you made of my rose bushes were only planted last year. Um, that, that again shows the, the focus on um, self-interest. Um, anger and homosexuality, uh, again, is a similar theme here. Um, this is Randy Kraft. Um, he, uh, killed. He, he again was greatly upset because of people's rejection of his homosexuality. He killed um, male, he killed males and left them in the most awful situation. I don't know the detail, you never sleep at night. Uh, but had sex with them and then performed hideous mutilation of their bodies, particularly their genital parts, um, in anger, but nonetheless had sex with them. And we had the measure of a talk a couple of years ago by Adrian Rain, who interviewed um, this chap and did a brain scan of him, and found that Adrian Rain found that his own brain was very different from a regular uh, criminal, but was very similar in his activity pattern to Randy Kraft's. So you need a bit of caution when you interpret 
brain imagery. The night stalker of Los Angeles, again, he was brutalized by his father. Um, he loaded himself up with enormous quantities of drugs of all sorts. Um, his cousin came back from Vietnam where he had raped and killed Vietnamese women and showed the pictures <coughs> to the young man who then fantasized about the pictures. Sexual inadequacy is sometimes a trigger. Uh, the fam most famous from the former Soviet world, um, Andrei Chikatilo, uh, again, he was sexually inadequate. Uh, he couldn't secure an erection unless there was violence involved, particularly the sight of blood, and then he could secure an erection. He got through, I think, 49 victims before he was caught and then executed by firing squad in um, what was then, well, he came from Ukraine, but he crimes in Russia. Another one is Christie. John Christie, made famous in this country by uh, Ten Rooms of Place, I don't know if you've seen the film, uh, back in the early 1950s. Apparently, he was sexually inadequate, except with dead women. Um, he was ridiculed at first for his sexual inadequacy. He tried it with prostitutes in, I think it was Halifax, somewhere in Yorkshire. Um, was quite, quite inadequate but was adequate with, with dead women. And so he killed a number of them in Notting's house in Notting Hill, 10 room to place, buried some in the garden, put some in a space in the kitchen and papered it over, and killed his wife and put her under the floorboards. And people, not surprising, the other tenants noticed the smell coming from here. He was hanged in around 1952 and could well have sent an innocent man to, to the, his grave as well who was found guilty living in the apartment just next door. Exposure to identifier. Now, here's what happens as well. You get I, I exposed to something aversive. It triggers fear, anger, or something like this, something negative. Fear, horror, disgust, something negative. <coughs> that then transforms itself into something positive. And the case in point is Harold Shipman. Shipman's particularly interesting. One could argue whether he's a sex link. I think he is a sex link serial killer. It all depends on what you mean by sex. Um, he killed probably the largest peacetime killer, although there's another case in the news now, amazingly enough, as a woman. That, that's not, that is very rare. Uh, but it very rarely happens. It does happen. I think Shipman was a, I think he had a sexual turn on the killing. I think what happened was, well, we know what happened was, that his mother died under the influence of a morphine injection. She was suffering from cancer. She was injected with morphine, uh, and she died. Um, Shipman was traumatized by it, but then revised it to something positive. So he sorted out killing his patients with morphine. Uh, it had to be something like morphine. He could have got away with it if he didn't inject it with potassium chloride, say. That would have killed them, but he wouldn't have been detected. Might still been going now. Uh, but morphine can be detected, and that, uh, that was the end of his career. It wasn't so much the detectives that solved, it was the undertaker who solved it first, and you noticed the extraordinarily large number of, of dead bodies he was taking away from the ship and being the doctor. It's often somebody, uh, not really a professional. Dennis Nielsen is another case of someone who advised the trauma. The death of his grandfather traumatized him terribly. He was really in love with his grandfather, didn't get on with his parents as such. Um, then, very traumatized, but then revised it to something positive and sought out that experience by killing young gay men in London in the 1970s. Slivko, a, a Russian serial killer, again, it's a similar story. He witnessed a boy, this is the young pioneers, it's something like the Boy Scouts, with a stronger political connotation in the Soviet Union. And they, they, they you see, the he was very successful at running camps for boys. But what he you know, experienced was the death of a boy in a traffic accident, which traumatized him. And then later, he eroticized him, and he uh, killed these, these whole string of these boys. 
Um, and we have a full, he's a very articulate man, educated man, and he documented all the reasons in very fine detail of why it all happened. Again, he went to his death with the firing squad. There are serial killers still in Russia, and they don't die now, and the Russians have abolished the death penalty. Fetishes, they play a role. An example of this is uh, Jerry Brudos from Eugene, Oregon. Um, he developed a fetish for shoes after a young man he picked up a pair of shoes from a dumpster and um, was scolded by his mother for doing so. He then walked around with <coughs> shoes, developed an attachment to shoes. He then would go out and steal women's shoes from their houses and then he moved from that on to grabbing women in the street, pulling their shoes off and taking them home. He then progressed, I'll spare you the details, but it was a horrific case, but shoes were at centre stage in the case. Forms have listed these over the sexual desire linked, but there's another, I think another variant on this theme, attachment uh, links up with sexual desire. Uh, and I think that this can explain a few cases, they're actually looking for company. They're desperately lonely, they want a partner and they can't find a partner. A case of this is Jeffrey Dahmer, one of America's most famous, and uh, he was desperate for company. And the first killing he did, I think the guy might still be alive if he hadn't left, turned his back on Dahmer and walked out. But he then, uh, again, it's an unusual case, he hated gays and he hated colored people, but the target of his anger was gay black Americans, for the most part which tells a similar story and all along. His early hobby was dissection, and he had body trauma, had a double hernia, and was in agony. Now, I believe these, that he's transferred those to his later killing career. He actually soaked up alcohol in enormous quantities. That doesn't help, because it damages the prefrontal part of the brain. With Dennis Nielsen, again, I think he was looking for company as much as anything. We ended up killing 17 young men, and this was this was uncovered not by the police but by a plumber, who who realised that the house called the plumber in because the drains were getting blocked, and they found no body parts. So that that was the downfall of Dennis Nilsson. Impulsive, unplanned killing. This is a tragic one a few years back in Bristol. Vincent Tabak and the landscape gardener uh, Joan Yates. Um, he had a history of violent pornography, and I think that sensitizes the brain to this sort of thing. And then, I don't believe the murder was planned, I think it was done on impulse. I, I, think, my, I, I think the police in Bristol agree with this sort of argument, that he had no prior intention. But he got into the company, he took it that that was a come on sign when she probably invited him for coffee tea or something as a neighbor. And then he couldn't stop himself once he got in the company and strangled her. Where are we now? Killer couples, briefly. Uh, that's the most notorious problem, Ian Brady, who might be called a philosophical, if you can use that term, a philosophical serial killer, in that he um, believed in the teachings of Nietzsche, that where there is no God, there, where, where there is no God, so therefore there is no morality, and strength, might is right, and so on. He'd read Marquis de Sade and... Um, he was quite as well educated and self taught largely, and he studied the Nazis, and so on. Um, the, quite what led him in this course, he too witnessed uh, the killing, uh, the death of a boy in a street accident. Just like Slidko. Whether that had anything to do with it, I don't know. So did Fred West. In fact, Fred West caused the death of a boy in a street accident. Again, whether that led them down this course, I really don't know. Um, Myra Hindley, by the way, did the OU degree. Yes, she did. She did. She did. She did. I know. Uh, so even some good progressive OU students threatened to resign. What do you say? want to share a university with her. Yes, absolutely. Um, here's an interesting case of um, Michel Fournere, uh, a French equivalent somewhat of Brady, and with his partner. Um, they, they set up a, a very awful pact between themselves that he would kill her ex-husband and a few other people she didn't like. Um, in return, she would find virgins for him. 
to rape and murder. Um, they're both in jail. Now we know, because he's given, he's given an articulate, educated man, we know what um, led him to this. And I have it here in the original, if you have any French readers that like it in the original. Here, when, this is about his fiance. When she confessed to me that she had already had a man, the world fell apart. It became a heap of <laughs> excrement. Um, my pride was hit very hard. Furthermore, the wound will never heal. Now that seems quite extraordinary, doesn't it, for 20th century France, which you realize a country with very liberal values about sexuality, that anyone should be so hung up about virginity. But, but then he thought, he felt, well, he, it is claimed, but we don't know, that his mother took his virginity from him. That is claimed. We don't know that, but we do know that this is his statement in his own words. We do know that. Um, and again, it, it seems quite extraordinary that, um, that someone should be so driven. But there we are. You know, there, 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 there are some strange things happening here. Bringing things together. I'm running out of time, so I'll cut short when I get the signal. Yep. Dennis, Dennis Rader, the uh, so-called BTK killer from Wichita, Kansas, um, he exemplifies a number of things. Uh, he was shy with girls, he developed a fetish about women's clothes, it stress and frust frustration he reported. Again, what this illustrates is that often these people are hypersexual only in the context of violence. Uh, he had a wife who apparently wasn't much interested in sex with a wife, by all accounts. He showed no interest in consensual sex. Um, he read books about this subject and he arrived at dopamine as being the answer to his, to his problems, overreactive dopamine. Since I was instrumental in developing the ideas about what dopamine is doing, then, then it's strange sort of affinity I feel with Dennis Rader in a bizarre kind of way compartmentalize morality. His comment, uh, it was interesting just how compartmentalized his morality was in that he sent, he made a phone call to the police in Wichita um, and said, is it possible to identify who sends you a floppy disk? And a quick acting police officer thought on his feet and said, no, we wouldn't have a clue if you send us a floppy disk, where it came from. So he sent a floppy disk saying things like, you're not having much luck catching me, are you? Now it's 31 years, how many more will I need to kill before you catch me? And all this taunting of the police. And of course they received it in the post, put it in their computer, and quickly revved up their engine and went round and picked him up because he had his address on there. Um, <laughs> the comment that he made was, about that, when court, it says, it seems to me that you can't trust anybody anymore. <laughs> I know, it's, I know he, it's so sad, but it, you have to have a laugh occasionally, otherwise you go mad studying this. You own a car, car is necessary. I'd make a very bad serial killer since they don't own, own a car. But most of these couldn't possibly have done it without a car to get away quickly to pick up their victims. Uh, the taunting of the police. Some reflections on the causes, uh, violent crime, these are mainly male phenomena. Violent crime, sexual promiscuity, pornography, fetishes, are not exclusively male, but they tend to be, and the desire for them is more a male thing. Responsibility and free will, they generally know it to be wrong, they're not judged to be psychotic, they're not mad, they know it to be wrong, uh, but they still go ahead, they anticipate, so um, they, they take what necessary precautions. They have all the equipment ready at home and they bring the victim home. They know exactly how to conceal. And they, they fail the policeman criteria. Uh, would you still do this if a policeman were watching you? And to a man, male men, they say no. They, it's obvious they wouldn't. So they know what they're doing. They know it's wrong. They still keep doing it. Uh, addiction. I'll zoom through this. I'll have three minutes to zoom through this. Is it a case of addiction? I believe that it is. Um, there you have Arthur Shawcross, Rochester, New York, killer. 
And he was in Vietnam where he recorded, you not want to see someone killed up close. You might not be able to handle it. I did not at first in Vietnam. The first person I shot and killed, I cried like a damn baby. I was shook to the roots of my soul. After the fourth and fifth one, it stopped bothering me, and I got to crave it. There couldn't be a clearer account of the switch from the negative to the positive. He killed a large number of women in um, New York State. Addiction comparison with other addictive activities. A transient lift in emotional state followed by a long-term fall. Alcohol and addictive drugs often licking, link into both sexual addiction and violence. Relapse often associated with a negative mood and proximity <coughs> to the incentive. Often an ideal incentive pursued in both sexual addiction and killing. Stressful periods increase the, te the tendency. Deprivation is perceived as being stressful. They show habituation and tolerance in each case, not necessarily deprivation. They have suffered withdrawal symptoms, drug, sex addiction, and violent sex. Craving is experienced. The use of crops, fetishes, dissociation, out of control, gender, uh, the sexual addiction and this are almost entirely female, not quite, but almost entirely. Whereas drug addiction is roughly 50-50, not a lot of drug. Not a one-to-one -one association with a partner, masturbation and fantasy. Michael Ross was executed, and the last man to be executed in the state of Connecticut. And he actually published an article in the journal Sexual Addiction and Compulsivity. Uh, detailing it, where he makes it sound very much like obsessional neurosis. He says, you know, how would you feel if you kept having the same thought? Have you ever had a song that keeps coming into your head repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly? Now, I don't buy the argument, because um, clearly in prison it's going to be unpleasant if you have something you can't do anything about it. But I suspect that giving, the, giving these images was a repetitive thing before he was caught. Um, enforced abstinence can be followed immediately by their social dislocation, alienation is common in all such cases, ambivalence about engaging, high arousal. I won't go through that one, I'll jump that. Finally, that's my book. There are serial killers in there, but not much. Thank you, Fred. Thank you.